Hey everyone, how's everyone doing here? Okay, just trying to set up a couple things here because I'm gonna be streaming this also on YouTube for those people that just wanna like chime in and they don't wanna like get involved in the discussion. There's always that alternative. I always give that option to people. And as usual, um, thank you very much for joining. Welcome everyone um, for joining this, this live uh, session. This is gonna be a live session introducing a few of the things that I found useful in the second chapter of the Dive into Deep Learning book, which we are, you know, which we are, we are gonna uh, study for uh, a few months. Um, I'm, I wanna talk about a few things before moving forward. Um, just a few things, just to clarify a little bit about the study group. I, I think there was a lot of confusions and a lot of questions. I don't think I did a really good job at the beginning, but I just want to clarify a few things before moving forward here. So I want to take a few minutes for that, and hopefully I don't take too much time. So the, the session for today will be uh, pretty basic. Actually, I don't have slides. I, I was kind of struggling to put together slides for this particular chapter of the book, because this book is a lot about it's a lot about the preliminaries, preliminaries that are important for applying deep learning. So the how to manipulate data, I think linear algebra, data processing, calculus, and the automatic differentiation, which I believe from this set is kind of the most important one. I'll spend some time running through a couple of examples. So I wanted to make this more like hands-on and doing a code walkthrough as opposed to presenting slides. I think it's a, a perfectly reasonable approach uh, for this particular chapter of the book. Um, obviously, as we jump into the you know later chapters, we may want to do a little things a little bit different. Um, we have a few, so we have a few folks that are interested in delivering, you know, leading some of the chapters. So that's really great, and, and I really appreciate that from those folks that want to participate. Um, I think that would help. Also, that would give me a little a little room to breathe as well, because <laughs> it's it's really difficult to be doing you know this back to back. Um, but I really appreciate that. I think it's it's quite useful and important that we do that. And you know, if anyone wants to deliver anything from those chapters. It doesn't have to be the entire chapter. Actually, we can do like a collaboration. Please feel free to reach out to me if you feel confident that you can maybe discuss a, a bit about, for instance, neuron, linear neural networks and, and the whole concept, or even if you're interested in doing like a code walkthrough, I would, you know, I'll be open to it. Uh, honestly, this is a study group. It's not a course or anything like that. So I think it's, uh, we can experiment with different formats. And I'm very open to that. So we still have a few people joining in. That's great to see. <clears throat> Again, if you have any questions, just leave it in the chat as I go along. Um, for this particular session, I have like a like an agenda. I have like a structure here, which I, I kind of include in this notebook. Um, I'll share the link to this notebook later on. I also have a few other resources that I want to share along with this notebook. So I have some additional notebooks that I think will also be useful for you. So note that I already jumped into a notebook. This is a collab notebook. Um, it's online. I already started to you know, jump into code because I think that's very important. I think that's where um, I think we should emphasize in terms of learning how to apply deep learning. Um, there's a lot of theory specifically for topics related to mathematics, but I think I think um, you know in time there will be there will be some um, time to actually dive deeper into some of the concepts such as backpropagation, for instance, and understanding the math. But I think doing that at this point in time is not really recommended, and I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, but we will talk, you know, at, at least at the surface, just to understand the ideas. And some of these things will come back again. Actually, all of these things that I put together in this notebook will come back again, and we will start to dive deeper into those. So I chose this format as opposed to, you know, diving deep into all the math parts and even going through the appendix, because I think it's very important to, you know, try to keep yourself give yourself some room, you know, maintain that pace and try to learn something and, and don't get discouraged along the way. It's really easy to get discouraged because obviously if you only see math, you start to think about, you know, how do I actually apply this to deep learning? How, what's the intuition behind this concept? And the only way to do that, um, specifically the way this book is formatted is to, you know, go through the chapters and then when we actually go into a concept, we can have a, a um, you know, a longer discussion about those concepts then. I think the book actually recommends this approach, and, and I totally see why that's the case. 
I mean, all these things that we're going to discuss today, you know, uh, if you look at different books, they are uh, written differently, right? And you have um, you know, some books that focus mostly on just the math part and some focus uh, mostly on the application part, but this book has a bit of both, which I think is, is, is quite nice. Okay. All right, so let's see, I'm, I'm gonna go here and try to do a couple of reminders. Don't wanna spend too much time here, but I think it's really important. So for this particular one, there will be no assignments for those people that are going for the, are going for the certificate of completion. There will be no assignment for this one. Again, this is, I, I chose it this way because I think it's really important to you know, look at this material. Don't get scared while looking at this material. It's kind of scary to see it in, you know, out of context. Um, when it starts to, when we start to apply all the different things in deep learning and then different architectures, you start to see how each one of those things um, start to fit in, right? Like in, in a puzzle kind of way. Um, so I think it's very important not to, not, not to get discouraged too easily here or get scared. Um, all these things uh, will come back again at some point in the future. So no assignments for this one. What I would say is that um, I would highly recommend, and I have some recommendations here. Um, I would highly recommend that you spend some time doing, going over the, the chapter. So if, for instance, like this one, you want to go through the linear algebra, before touching this one, I would say jump in directly into the, so there's the appendix, mathematics for deep learning here. Going to this one, I think the explanation here is pretty nice. It gives you an idea of uh, how these different um, different uh, fields are kind of used and adopted in deep learning. So like geometric and linear algebra operations, going through each one of those very important concepts. Um, to be honest, not all of these things apply in deep learning, but I think just getting a really good understanding of them really helps. And you can use this as a study guide, right? You don't have to learn it one shot. Uh, there was someone asking in the, in the chat whether we needed to learn everything and all the additional readings I provided. No, you don't. And I think that's not a really a smart approach. As I was saying, most of the things that will come up later on, um, any of the concepts like back propagation, which are really key concepts, we will go through the mat and try to spend some time there understanding those and, and build intuitions about those. Um, but there are things like here, like distributions, right? Do we use all of these? Maybe not, but it's really important to get an idea of the concept. And I think that's why the book uh, even provides some code examples, right? You go through each one of them and trying to understand what are those distributions and how they are used um, for some analysis or something like that, right? So just get an idea for it. Right? So that's how you do it. This is similar to when you do like an undergrad, you, you first, you know, you don't jump into a deep learning course. First you do some probability and then eventually you do um, machine learning course. So it's always good to get those fundamentals. And I would say, instead of uh, giving you an assignment, I would say I would want to encourage you and push you to actually go through some of this content and even some of the content that I recommended in the repo. So I, let me just look at, take a look at this one, session two. So just go through each one of these ones. I think this one will become more relevant later on, not so important um, right now, uh, but I think this will be a really great resource Okay, so there you have like videos, if you prefer videos, I think this one, you know, you can go through it over time. It, it, it's gonna take you a little while to actually go through each one of the videos and, and they even have assignments and some kind of notes as well. So those are really helpful. And I've seen like people spending more efforts trying to create bite-sized content as well. I think those are really helpful as well because they kind of you know, maintain the scope. Uh, you don't wanna jump all over the place. You just maintain the scope on the concepts that are relevant here. Okay, so I think these ones in particular, I recommended this before. I think these ones are really, really awesome. They, they are really in the context of machine learning. So I think, you know, that they're, they're quite good in terms of scope. So that's my recommendation. No assignments, just spend a little bit more time. Um, believe me, if you, if you get a better intuition into those things, they will come in handy as we uh, proceed with these chapters. Okay, so that's what I was trying to explain here. These points that I mentioned here, uh, you don't want to consume it on one shot. I think that's, uh, it's going to discourage you. It's not realistic to actually consume those things. They usually take a semester or two, you know, a couple of months to actually uh, understand that concept really well. And that's not too important today. I mean, right now, because we are going to take it step by step. And as I said, each one of those concepts that becomes more important and relevant, we're going to go through, you know, and build some intuition around that. Okay, so... Let's see, some concepts will not be covered there right away. This is what I was explaining until when they are applied. 
I think that's a better approach. Right, so if you need to, if you need help with some specific part of the book, I always say go to the official discussion forum. I was checking it out yesterday. It's pretty active. Um, I don't, I'm not sure, you know, how, how fast they reply, but if you really want the fast response, maybe you can use our GitHub repo and then I'll take a look at that and see if I can help you to answer some questions and maybe other people also get involved. So I just encourage you to do that. Um, if there's something you didn't understand. Okay, the, the, the schedule has been announced. So I announced the schedule, I think, let's see, let's go to this part here, right? So that's kind of a tentative. And, you know, I said, initially I said, every two weeks we're gonna do like a, like a chapter. I think that's doable. I mean, if you're beginning, you know, to study deep learning and we do this every week, I'm pretty sure by, the, by halfway you'll be, you know, you'll be really burnt out. This is a lot of content. If the book is, a, is really, you know, it's a very long lengthy book. So I think taking this approach, you know, going slowly will help us. And notice that towards, I think the, the middle of the program, we kind of accelerate things a bit. So at some point we're doing like on a weekly basis and some of the chapters we have combined them as well. So I think this one, I don't remember clearly which one it was, but there was one that I kind of merged. So these two will be merged. I don't think it's necessary to have a multi-layer perception session alone. Maybe we can combine it with the, deep learning computation. So I'm gonna take those two and combine them. And you know, by, by, by February, I think, you know, this is kind of like a semester if you think about it. And this is how this book was built. I think it's perfect because it's, it's roughly a semester of, of work and going through the exercises and everything. So by February, we should be done. Okay, and then and, and we will have a project. There will be a project, you know, if you're not involved in the certificate of completion, uh, you will, we will be finishing by February 6th, but those people that are engaging the project and want to go for that certification, there is always that final project, which I will announce, I think, roughly around December or even earlier. It depends on how we, you know, how we, how we progress here. All right, so I think that's enough for the announcements. Any other questions you may have, please let me know. I'm jumping all over the place here, but I, hopefully those things are clear. And I wanted to clarify some of the questions that you all have been asking, okay? So a couple of suggestions from people here. I think, yeah, the Imperial College, those, those ones I, I recommended are pretty good. And they even have a Coursera course as well if you wanna dive deeper. Now, some of these things, uh, they become even more important and relevant if you uh, wanna become a researcher. Definitely, I think, because if you're gonna go jump into, say, you know, apply the mail, um, you need to know, you know, these different equations and how they how they um, apply in deep learning or machine learning, whatever you're doing. But if you're just going to apply them, then maybe you don't really need to dive deeper. So it all depends on 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 your on your you know, your scenario here. So the agenda data manipulation. I remove data processing. I'm not going to do any data processing. I think that you can do it on your own. I don't have much to provide for probability. I just wanted to focus on these two things because these are the things that will become really relevant in the next two uh, sessions that will come. So that's why I'm gonna spend more time on these three, the data manipulation, linear algebra, and the calculus and automatic differentiation, which I, like I said, kind of the most important, I think, concept in, the, in this chapter. Um, if you don't understand this, I think you need to spend more time trying to understand it because that uh, will give you some idea on how to use the different functionalities, either you're using TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so forth. This thing is very important. All toolkits support it nowadays. So that's what we're gonna spend our time on. Okay, so I'm, I'm monitoring the chat as well. If you have any questions, I can answer those. Um, or I will leave some of those questions towards the end. We will have a discussion towards the end. Okay, I'm gonna open the floor. Uh, people can share what they learn as well, anything that puzzled them. In, in the discussion they want to have, any ideas they want to share as well, we will um, leave some time for that, right? So hopefully we have some time for that. Hopefully I don't spend too much time. This is a very lengthy notebook. I try to uh, kind of, you know, just, just to provide some credit here, but this is from the D2L.ti notebook. It's not my code. I just adopted the code and I'm using all the code examples, right? And all credit goes to the authors and, and, and the contributors of the code. So other people are actually contributing code, which is really great. And I hope that this group at some point in time as, as, the, as the book grows, uh, we can contribute back as well. And, and that's one of the things that I wanna encourage. I think that would be really, really great. All right, let's go into the first one. So data manipulation, right? What is this about? So someone is asking here, 
Is this notebook available somewhere? No, it's not available yet. I'll make it available right after this session, probably by tomorrow you will have it. And I will also, because I have to add some other notebooks that I'm gonna use as well, which I've prepared ahead of time. And I think those ones will, will be really, really useful for you. So I have another, so let me just show you a, a brief preview. So I have this one that I can adopt it from Andre Karpati. I don't know if you know him, but he's a researcher in computer vision as well. Um, he wrote a tutorial a long time ago uh, I thought his tutorial was pretty useful for me when I get when I got started um, to understand bot propagation and these things. And so what I did, because his code was on, I think it was JavaScript. So what I did was try to kind of transfer the code, you know, to plain Python code. And this really helped me a lot. So I use this a lot to like study and so forth and try to understand, get my own intuitions, um, you know, plug in my own functions, try to confuse, calculate some derivative myself manually. And, and, and try to check those and make sure those are, you know, are correct. So all this stuff, you don't really need to do it now because we have libraries that does that for you as we will touch on this in this session. Uh, but, but that's important. I will share this one if people want to get into that, um, you know, if they're into that. All right, so let's start. So here we're going to touch on data manipulation. The chapter is mostly about, let's just go back here. And I'm going to use this as a guide. But you know, I won't go back here too much. So it's about getting started, operations, broadcasting mechanism. This is very important here. Um, as you transform data, you know, you're playing with different uh, tensors of different sizes. Maybe you want to apply broadcasting to maybe a slice of that tensor. So it's really important to actually learn this concept. Um, it comes up uh, again and again. So indexing and slicing, obviously, this is your slicing and dicing of the data. Um, saving it into memory as well. You have to, uh, when you're dealing with deep learning, you're dealing with a lot of parameters, you're dealing with really, you know, really huge matrices that consume a lot of memory. And some operations, they do consume a lot of memory compared to others. And you have to like understand whether you're actually allocating memory properly here. So we'll touch on that as well. You know, converting uh, Python objects, if you want to do something special with it, maybe use it to say, visualize it using Map.lib. You, that conversion is becomes really important. And I'll we'll show some examples on that. Okay. All right. So let's go back. So, you know, first step is I've installed two libraries here. We have two libraries. Hopefully you can see it. This is the, um, is the, by the way, the size, is the font size okay? Just give me a plus in the chat if it is okay. If it's not, then I probably need to enlarge in the font. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Perfect. Right, so it's import search. That's how you import it. Again, the code is in the, I'm just kind of copied the most important ones I thought that would be useful to go over and try to explain here. Um, you know, you can always go and, and, and look at the, the, the extra examples that were provided in the chapter. So some examples here, we have the, so we have an X, you know, uh, we have an, a kind of like a range, right? So if you want to provide a range of say some integers here, you can use this function. So you use directly search, search at a range and 12, and that gives you an array. So an array from zero to 11. Note how it starts from zero, right? You can actually do start it from wherever you want as well. So that's something you can do. So you, you can determine, you can configure that you want it to start from one as opposed to 12, as opposed to zero, and you have that option as well. Um, so one thing that's really useful as you play around with these functions, I really like the documentation. Honestly, you can actually just do it from here. So you can always go you know, you just go here and say like the function that you want to uh, understand a little bit more. So like this one, let's see, a range. Right, it gives you a little bit more about the function. I do tend to go to the documentation. I don't know, it's much faster for me, but you can use the help command to get an idea of what this function does and you know what it expects, what's the output gonna look like. And it even gives you an example here at the bottom, just so in case you're kind of lost on what it is. So that's always really useful. So I'm just gonna comment this out. I'm not gonna be use it here. Okay, so as we go along here, right, the, the, we, we wanna check things like the shape, really important, you always, um, as you create tests, when you're developing your code for your deep learning um, models, you want to check shape. It's a really important uh, function. I really, I think these shapes, these functions make a lot of sense. The the view, the, the shape, the size, all those nice functions to get an idea of the shape of the function. Uh, sorry, the shape of the, the tensor here. So the shape of the tensor in this case is 12, right? It gives you the answer here. 
Um, how many number of elements could be useful as well? Um, as you are doing, for instance, uh, some type of normalization, for instance, maybe you wanna understand how many elements are in a shape. You will see that example later on. Uh, you can use the NOML. So the NOML gives you the number of elements in the in this particular tensor, right? So everything is a tensor, by the way. I'm not using vector. I just call everything a tensor because that's what you uh, refer to it when you use torch, PyTorch. Okay, so number of elements, 12. And you can see here, I can just run it again. That's 12. And you can reshape the tensor as well, okay? No, I think, so someone asked, Torch is the same as PyTorch. No, I think it's PyTorch. Um, I don't know why I call it Torch. Uh, I think it, there, we used to have, I don't know the history about it, but I, I think we used to have a Torch as well, but, and it became PyTorch. I'm not too sure, to be honest, about the history of it, but I, I, I know that this one is PyTorch. Um, I don't think they're the same. All right, so how to reshape it? Maybe you take um, a tensor and maybe reshape it, right? So if you have something like this, right, which is just a vector and you maybe you wanna reshape it into like a matrix and you have some dimensions that you wanna provide. So here the three, four, this is just three by four. Notice this one is the kind of like the number of rows, right? And the number of columns, so to speak. Um, you can use that function reshape. That's very useful as well as you, um, as you maybe transform data, um, your, your data into some kind of special shape that's become useful. Um, so here is more like um, dimension, right? Inferring dimension again, uh, how do you do that? You can, so in, in, in some cases, maybe you don't really know and you don't even need to provide the, the, the second dimension, you just provide the minus one. Actually, you can do it with the, you can do it the other way around as well. So, you know, this function actually infers the other dimension that was missing. So in this case, if I provide a tree, right, it's gonna infer that this one is a four. Um, so that becomes really useful. Actually, if you look at code, developers tend to use this one a lot. Um, you know, so, so get, get familiar with this one, practice it and, and try to understand what it's doing because this one will, you will see this a lot in code that you try to adopt later on. Yeah, this is what I like. So people are <laughs> providing some kind of historical background here on Torch and PyTorch and so forth. Um, so that's great to see. Um, all right, so all right, so that's the dimension stuff, and then we have the uh, let's say we want it. It's very important. Also, some cases we want the ones, we want the zeros. We want to create very very standard matrix, and we want to like fill it in as well. And so we only need to provide a dimension here, all right? And it's going to create some zeros for you. You can actually put ones here as well, and there are those special type of matrices which you can create. Those come in really handy later on as you say initialize the weight matrix. Those things become quite important and easy to use, right? You don't need to create your own function or anything like that. Those things you can just leverage pretty easily, All right? This is the ones, this is the example with the ones. You create, the, you provide your dimension, right? The two, three, four, right? It's the, like, a, I think it's a second, I believe a second order the matrix or something like that. Yeah, it's gonna have the, the three dimensions. Okay, so here we have the, uh, maybe you wanna uh, maybe initialize those values using some kind of distribution as well. So you have the Gaussian, the normal distribution, the rand n. This is gonna populate the matrix depending on the size you give it, right? Populate the matrix with some of those values. So you have those values. This is quite useful. This is used a lot again for weight initializations. Um, but this will come in handy later on. <clears throat> so we have the, so let me see some questions here. Right, so we have reshape. Um, okay, I think, uh, I think those are okay. Um, I thought there was like a question there on. It's hard to, to, to monitor two screens here. I'm on two screens, but it's kind of difficult because I'm also monitoring the YouTube stream as well. Uh, keep your questions coming, okay? If I don't take them now, I'll take them later. All right, so they have so we have the the how to initialize a matrix as well. So you can initialize a matrix with your own provided values, right? So this one is just providing it here, um, your own like vectors and that's what make a matrix. Um, so note that the, right, the, the list on the, on the outermost, the outermost list 
um, that's your, I think that's, I believe that's your axis zero. And the ones, uh, the inner list, those are, are referring to the, 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 mm, the y axis. So axis one. So axis zero and axis one. And you can, you can look into the book. They actually explain that as well. Um, and that's really important to know because sometimes the book says, you know, what well, the zero axis, one axis. Um, sometimes you can get these mixed, and it's very important to not get get them mixed. Mm. Okay, so element wise operations as well. So this one is more like you know you want to maybe run some operations on those uh, individual components of the of the tensors. So if you have two sensors like this, like x x and y, right, which are just vectors here, and you want to do some operations in between them, you can actually. Um, you know, this, whatever you apply here, whatever operation, if it's a, a, an addition, a multiplication, a division, or whatever is in this case is an exponentiation, right? This is just element wise operations. Just take each one of those and apply whatever operations. So in this case, um, you can look at the example X plus Y so is one plus two is going to give you a three and so forth. And the great thing about these functions, when you use them like this, Right. Notice how the even even the type changes. Right. So um, it's even it's even smart to that. So because we had one um, you know, one, one <clears throat> float here or something like that, it's going to take that and convert it into a sort of like a float as well. So all those conversions are very important to get familiar with because types are really important here. Of course, when you're dealing with types, uh, sometimes it expects uh, you know, a double, sometimes it's like a float. These things are quite important to understand. So when you're doing the operations, keep an eye on that as well. And there are different ways to, you know, test this, to create tests in your code. I think this is something we're going to spend some time on, like doing kind of like unit tests, because I think when you develop deep learning models, that um, will save you a lot of time in terms of experimentation, and you avoid a lot of mistakes. Um, this one is more like, uh, you can actually do the, you know, exponentiation as well, just call it using the, from the, directly from the, from this module torch, so just do the exponentiation and you pass in the, the matrix as well. So there are different ways you can do this, right? And it works really nicely. And you see the same result, I think. Right, you concatenate, though this is more about manipulation. Um, so, you know, we want to put together, say, a stack of, matrices or stack of vectors or something like that to get a resulting matrix. Uh, those functions also become useful. Um, and so this one again shows you some examples of how you can do some concatenation. Um, you know, you select the dimension as well. So if you want to do it on the innermost, innermost um, axis or the outermost, sorry, the innermost list or the outermost um, list, however you want to do it. So here we selected the, the the yeah, axis zero, that's the outer list, as I said, right? So axis zero. So, you know, the one that's in the outside. So whatever you are adding, it will be added, say like a row, right? It's gonna add, be added like a row. You can see the example here, X, Y. So X has 12 here. And um, yeah, so this is just gonna be from zero to 11 and, you know, reshaped. So it's gonna be like a matrix. And then we're gonna take these ones and we're gonna concatenate them. And you can see here the result. So I think this one is this one here, right? So you can see from zero to 11. Um, and then I think we did something. Yeah, so it's the, the Y, right? So the Y is added to the bottom. So this is the outer list. And then we have the inner list as well. So in the inner list, we're going to put them inside the list. So we're going to take those items and we're going to add them. And so they're going to be added on that dimension, OK? So very important to get familiar with this. Practice this a lot. Um, it's quite useful to understand this. When you actually read code online, um, you know, this, this stuff will be, you will see this a lot. So very important to familiarize yourself with it. I will share this later on as well. So, you know, you can practice directly from here. You can, you can try it out yourself and try to get more understanding of it. Uh, there's just a lot of stuff that I need to cover here. So I'm going a little bit fast here as well. So logical statements, what is this about? Again, sometimes you want to test you know, maybe do a test and try to say, it, let's say this was like in the context of deep learning, training a deep learning model, maybe you want to test your, say, your predicted values and, you know, your ground truth. So maybe you need to do some comparison. So that becomes your logical statement. 
And this one gives you, it's really nice, right? All you need to do is just use the equal equal here, uh, the double equal and gives you, you know, this result. So we take two matrices in this example and we're looking for those values and match. So you can see here in this position, it did match, this position is the same. Those are the same values. That's pretty useful. And there's a lot more, of course, in the, in the, in the book, but I just selected the ones that I thought are gonna come pretty soon. Broadcasting, right? Very important. I have an example here. So with the broadcasting later on, we're going to see how it's applied with some other op op matrix operations. But this one is a basic example. So we have a matrix that was reshaped, three to one. So you can see it here, right? And then we have this B matrix, right? So it's from zero to zero to one. We kind of reshape it as well. So it looks like this. And so now, you know, this, these are of different shapes. So now when you're doing this element-wise operations, right? It's going to behave a little bit different, right? Because they're different shapes. So far, we have been using similar shapes, uh, but in this case, the, 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 the operations behave a little different. And, you know, in order to support different shapes, obviously the broadcasting is the one that supports that. Um, you don't really need to know what it's doing behind the scenes, but all you need to understand is how, how, how it applies, right? So, so here we see that we have zero, one, and we just want to add, right? So we want to say zero plus Zero is going to give you zero. One plus zero is going to give you one. So you see how it's being arranged, right? And then the same here: zero plus one it gives you one. One plus one gives you two. And so it's you know it's stacking them up like this, right? So it totally depends on what comes first. Okay. All right. So we have we can you know look at the x. This is our x matrix from zero to eleven, right? That's our range. We already reshaped it. And we have, we can actually index into those elements. If you want to access one of the elements, you can in, in index into in, in those elements. You know, I'm assuming, so first of all, I, I would apologize if in advance if you're not, uh, if you haven't seen PyTorch before, uh, because, uh, you know, maybe this is already confusing for you because some of the function I'm using. But if you have used NumPy, it's quite similar. Actually, the, the maybe the function names change a bit, but under the hood is NumPy. Um, and I think it's quite similar. Um, there are some things that are missing in NumPy that are available in PyTorch because it's a more higher level library. But I think the fundamental parts, at least the ones that I'm covering here, you can easily create code for NumPy. So you can do like reshape, I think for NumPy, you can do a range, probably won't be a range, but you, there you have like a NumPy range also that you can you know, set up here. So feel free to actually do that as well on your own. But um, the idea here is to get started with PyTorch. And I think that makes sense because we're gonna use that mostly um, throughout the throughout the chapters, so that's the indexing, right? Subscripting into one of those um, elements of the matrix. It's pretty easy. You can see here that if we did the minus one, which is going to be the last one, so that's the last one that was subscripted. So you can see here uh, that's the last row, so to speak. Here, okay. Um, you can actually put zero if you want. So if I select zero, what's an index zero, right? It's the first row. You can see here first row. So you can actually slice it as well. So, you know, maybe you are interested in maybe two rows or something like that, or maybe just the last, last two vectors, you can actually do something like this. So note here with the notation. So the first value is, of course, um, the first value is, I believe it's inclusive. And the second value is exclusive. What does that mean? Well, we look at the, right, at this axis, we look at the, the first, which is going to be this one, right, starting here. And then it's going to look at the third item. But because this is exclusive, it's going to just take you know, the second one and it's going to create that range. So it's just going to select those two. That's very important to know. Whichever I think, whichever one you use, NumPy, TensorFlow, whichever one you use is the same behavior. Very important to know. I made, I made a lot of mistakes when I used to use this one when I was beginning, I always got this mixed up. Very important to know because you know, maybe you're leaving out data that you shouldn't. So take a look at that as well. All right, so a word of memory location, which becomes really important. Sometimes I see you know, beginners, they, they say, oh, you know, my code cannot run. Somehow this code was available online and I, I cannot run it. It's running out of memory. I adopted it, but something is going on. I think the code is correct. Um, but I cannot run it because I don't have enough resources or enough GPU memory or something like that. What that happens is because sometimes it's the memory location. So sometimes what you want, right, is to reuse, right? So you can reuse 
um, you know, certain objects. Um, and in order for you to do that, you have to be you have to pay attention to you know, how memory is allocated. So every time you say you want to create something like this, where you have like a like a y matrix, then you have something like an x where we already created the x. The, the x is just this one here at the top, and I think the y was created as well somehow. Yeah, then we have a y as well on the top. Um, you know, you want to do some operation between them, right? So now this one when it's uh, we're going to get evaluated. So the first thing that gets you, if you know, if you come from Python world, you know that this one gets evaluated first, right? And so once it's get evaluated, then the Y actually points, right, to that, to that result. So now Y become, Y is pointing to somewhere else now, right? And so when you do something like this, when you take the ID, so the ID is just where it's pointing, right? The address of the reference object. So you want to check where it's pointing, it's actually pointing to uh, well, the before one was before we actually did this operation. Uh, it's not pointing to the same thing anymore. So you actually did something with Y, which you know changed the values completely because now it's pointing to somewhere else, right? And you have allocated new memory. Just know that. You know, we have we have the before and we also have the Y. So now we have two things that exist. So that could you know come as a could come could come as a as a problem as you work with large data sets. So always make sure you keep that in mind. Yeah, that's right. So um, yeah, before I DY, that's making the, the, the shallow copy. Indeed. All right, so here, it is, it, it, this is again, this is, comes in the book with some examples. Um, so you know, have this Z, which is just like zeros, has a shape of Y as well. Uh, I just printed out Z here just so, so you can see it's just zeros. It takes the shape of Y. So zeros like is really nice for that. Um, and you, you know, we want to print it out. So you can actually see that when we did this one, um, you know, this one was done in place, right? So it didn't, it didn't need to do some kind of new allocation. If that's what you're interested in, then you know, be, be, be very cognizant of that. You know, understand that um, when you do this kind of operation here, you're always going to create um, you know, creating, you're using more memory in that sense. Um, so when you do something like that, let's say you create this, this new matrix and then you know you, you want to evaluate this and you want to assign that directly to Z, right? So you're not really creating um, copies anywhere. So you're just going to directly, um, it's going to be directly applied to this matrix. So that's how you do it, right? Otherwise, if you did something like this, then you did Z again, then it's going to create its own, you know, its own thing. And it's going to, uh, Z is going to point to that new thing. So I always keep that in mind. You can test it as much as you want and you can see for yourself that that's the case. You can see that once we did this, this style here with the in-place operations, it was very explicit. You can see that it's pointing basically um, uh, to the same place, right, in memory. Yes, the plus and Y, that's right, the, yes, Marshall. Um, the plus, plus Y also does that in place, that's right. So there are many ways you can do it. That's the beauty about Python. You can do it different ways, uh, but this is just showing the examples from the book. All right, so converting to other Python objects, this is what I was saying, by transforming you know, from one, one format to another, that comes in really helpful, especially as you, you know, you're done with your modeling, then you wanna do something with the results, maybe wanna do some kind of, um, some kind of visualization, you want to plot something, maybe you want to use a NumPy for that because some of those libraries, they only support NumPy. I don't know if they directly support Python, at least when I was starting to use it, they didn't. So I always had to do this conversion myself manually, right? Maybe convert something to uh, a pandas data frame or something like that. So those are the things that really come in helpful and just check out the examples. I think they're quite useful to understand the concept of conversion of those objects. So this one is more about scalars, right? So you can create a scalar, blah, blah. you have the example here. And then you can do, you can actually obtain the scalar values directly. So you can see here is a 2.5. It doesn't show you like it's a tensor anymore, right? You actually get the scalar values. And those are nice because this one will become useful when you're collecting your losses and you wanna do an average on those losses, um, those loss values, um, you know, and you wanna print them out, say something like that, then you, you, this one will become really handy. I can actually do some conversion on it as well. So you can convert into a float, you can convert into an int as well once you have it in that, um, yeah, once you have it in this, this storage. So it's quite flexible. You can always do the conversion as well. 
So that's it. That was the data manipulation. Um, it's very, it's, it's quite uh, very, very, I think, um, I think it's a light introduction into data manipulation. And there are some more examples which I didn't cover, but you know, look into that. If, if, if the book doesn't provide enough examples for you, um, you can always look for those things, right? That's why I kind of provide like keywords here, read into those things. There are enough blogs online that you can actually take a look and try to understand. And one place that I always recommend is the tutorials. If you're, if you're you know, getting started with PyTorch, I always go to the tutorials. There are quite some good examples to get you ramped up. So there are like 60 minute blitz tutorials that get you ramped up pretty easily. And those ones I would recommend because these things do come up again there and they discuss it, like memory allocation and these things that are quite important when you're you know, mm. trying, to, mm. trying to build your deep learning models. Right, so let's jump into the second section. So that's the linear algebra. I actually took some time for the first section. I didn't expect it, but you no, know, it happens. It happens because these things are, I, I, like I wanted to emphasize on, 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 on some of the things that are important because they will come back again later on. And everything that I'm discussing here, I've seen the book ahead of time. I know they are gonna come back again. Um, so when you see it again, you know, understand that we already covered them. And if you had any questions around them, just ask, okay? Linear algebra. What is this about? So linear algebra. So, you know, you're dealing with tabular data a lot, right? When you're dealing with machine learning problems, there's tabular data and, you know, you want to get some understand properties of data, for instance, or you want to do some kind of distance metrics, uh, calculate some distance metrics from your data as well. Maybe do some kind of causal similarity between the vectors. So these are things that usually come up and you know, always, always you will see them in deep learning. So that's where you would need deep, um, linear algebra, right? So it's, it's just the language of, of how, to, um, how to analyze the vectors, how to maybe calculate some, uh, put some operations between the vectors and, 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 and calculate maybe the, um, the magnitude of a vector or something like that, um, you know, the angle of, of vectors in space. So this is the language linear algebra. So here's a scalar representation. We have some examples, right? It's just scalars, again, represented as tensors. You can see them at the bottom here. And you wanna maybe do some arithmetic operations on them. So arithmetic operations here at the bottom, you can see the examples, right? And they work nicely, right? It's like you take them individual scalar values and you just do your operations, they work nicely. So no problem with that. And so from there, from scalars, we jump into vectors, right? So vectors, Again, very useful data structure. Um, uh, you can see that you, you can create some vector using the A range. We already spoke about the A range. There are other types of um, maybe <clears throat> functions that you can use to create special kind of vectors as well. But this example is the one we're gonna keep using here. And then we say we can subscribe into those elements similar to what we did with our matrix before. So on the third element, you can see that uh, on the third, um, index here, we see that it's the tensor, uh, the value tree, scalar value tree. Um, you wanna maybe say the length of, 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 of that vector X, you gonna know, four, right? It's four elements. You can actually use NOML. Remember the NOML, that's what you would use here. And right, that's useful for normalization as well. And you can see here that we have also tensor Y, right? We have two vectors. And if we have this example, we can actually do um, if you do a length wise, I was going to look at the outer list, right? So it's, if it's the outer list, we have two, right? One, two. So it's going to give you two here. So print L Y, length of Y is going to give you two. And if you look at the size, of course, the size is two by three. So the shape of the tensor, like here you can see the shape. And um, okay, so the shape is going to be four. So you can see here it's four, it's giving you directly the number. That's quite useful as well. Um, you can always use this to maybe extract the dimensions of a particular tensor. Right? If you have a, a, maybe a tensor with higher dimensions, maybe this one you wanna extract maybe the, a dimension, the third dimension or something like that. You can always do that. You can reference that as well. Right, so that's just about shape. So that's shape, we covered that before as well. And of course, from scalars, we jump to vectors, then we jump to matrices. Right, kind of one of the most useful data structures that we use in deep learning. And you can see that this just gives you an example of a matrix at n by n. So you can see that we are using the same function because we're lazy. We don't want to type those vectors in and we can reshape it, right? So you now we have from zero to 19 here with that shape 554. 
and you can access it, right? Access scalar elements in a matrix. So if you want to access one of those that exists, one of those items that exist in here, you can always do that. So you can say, you know, I want the first in the first. So with the zero axis, I want that to be one. So it's going to be this one. And I want, you know, on the one axis, I want it to be the third element. So it's going to be, I think it's, yeah, so it's zero, one, two, three. I always start with zero. Zero, one, two, three is going to be this one, right? So that's what you get here. Okay, so again, accessing rows. So we did an example before, but this one gives you an example in the context of a matrix. So we want maybe say this particular vector in this matrix, uh, we can always access that. You provide the index, so that's one, right? For those of you that use pandas or NumPy, you know this already, you should know this stuff. And then, you know, <clears throat> all the items, right? So this, this says I want all, and that particular axis, so I want all the elements. So practice that if you're not familiar with that, that that's, you know, try to create uh, matrices with higher dimensions and try to use this and get familiar with it. I always do that, you know, try to practice this a lot and, and, and I try to do some kind of operations and try to understand it in my head. As you go to higher dimensions, everything's just complete, you, you get completely lost because it's so hard to actually, um, you know, imagine uh, uh, some kind of um, object in, in, in such high dimension. So. Um, it always comes with practice, right? And you just try to use these functions to get that idea, an idea of that. Okay, so transpose of matrix. This is just a transpose, right? The transpose is also very important because this is, has to do with shapes. Sometimes uh, with some shapes, you need to convert your data into some kind of special shape or you need to, you know, maybe set up, uh, set up your data in, in, in columns as opposed to vectors, which is what we do in deep learning a lot. Uh, you will always uh, rely on this one, the transpose. So if you look at the example here, it shows you exactly what the transpose is and what it's transforming. I just kind of print them out like this and just to give you visually what the transformation looks like. So if you have the, for instance, you have the, the B, so this is the B, no, sorry, this is the A transpose. So I haven't printed out the A. Let me just print out the A, Let's see what happens. Oops, I haven't defined A. Let's go to this way, Let's go to here. Right, so we have our A, we have our A transpose. Notice what's happening, right? It's just taking the, what looks like the columns and then it's just, oh, sorry, it's taking what looks like the, the rows and, you know, I didn't actually make them into columns. So, you know, rows, columns, rows, columns. Again, this, this stuff is it's sometimes confusing, but visually putting it like this does help. And I'll show you for confirming what's going on. <sighs> okay. Yep, we're still we're still on tensors and matrices. Um, no, that, that's that's those are the fundamental data structures. Quite important to get used to them. Um, so symmetry as well, symmetric matrices, right? So we have some kind of matrix, and you can see the matrix how it looks here, right? This is, a, this is kind of a symmetric matrix. You can see that it doesn't matter if we do. Uh, a transpose on it, it will give you about the same. So it's the same, right? You can see here when we transpose, comply some transpose of uh, operation to this matrix, it gives you the same. And you can actually just test it with this, with the logical um, operator there. Okay, so matrices, we jump into tensors, right? So tensors, higher order, right? They're higher order and you can, uh, they can generalize, right? You can put as much dimensions as you want there. Um, you can see this one has three and you know, you, 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 these ones become more difficult of course, but let's say we wanted to extract, let's so say the first matrix or something like that from this particular tensor, um, you can see what the result will be here. I think I'm, is there someone on the, uh, let's see. Okay, I just muted it. Okay, hopefully you're bearing with me. This is, um, you know, it, it's quite tedious to be honest, going through the different examples. Um, but I think, you know, having having to go through these examples and understanding them visually, it, it, I'm just explaining to you like the process of how I actually learned this stuff. Um, there's no like magic one that I, oh, you know, I understand this because I use this kind of special function. No, everything I learned it visually. I don't know, I'm like a visual learner and I always learn things visually. So I always want to plot things. I want to print those stuff. And that's how I learned how these things 
um, work and then and, and what they're doing behind the scenes, right? Because you get this like higher level, higher level functions and sometimes, you know, you, you get confused about what they do. So it's always good to check and test, right? Check and test. And I think the book really emphasizes on that as well. Yeah, this one is again, what, what I was talking about before. So this one is more, um, you're allocating new memory, right? So you're creating a clone. You're specifically saying you wanna create a clone of that. And so, you know, when you do this kind of, um, when you check it with the ID, were they pointing to the same? No, it's not pointing to the same anymore because uh, you have explicitly created. And a clone, right, it's, it's, you use it a lot in Python, I think, to create copies and, and um, you know, uh, when this was, um, uh, it's just a way to say that you want to allocate new memory explicitly, right? So again, many different ways you can do this. Sometimes there are shortcuts, sometimes it's more explicit. Um, understand sometimes, you know, it's not something new, it's just a different way to do it. And I think Python is really wonderful for that. But again, for beginners, this may be a little bit confusing. But no, it's just another option. All right, so this one is the Hadamard product, right? This one comes up a lot. Um, so this is more about the multiplication, element-wise element multiplication. So the A and B, some kind of multiplication there. And that's just showing you that. It's just a kind of like a special matrix, but um, yeah, it's got a special name as well there. Um, and, the, and the book has all the definitions, has all the, of course, um, how do you end up with a matrix like this? And how do you actually compute, calculate the values for each of the rows or even each of the columns? So it, it's always there, right? The formal definitions are there as well. But you know, maybe you don't want to spend too much time on that because it's just pretty obvious what it's doing. Okay, multiplying, adding tensor by scalar as well. So you can take something like a matrix, you have a scalar, you do some operation between them and you know, you, you always get, um, so you get a different results here. So you have, for instance, here the X, right? that's what I'm printing out here. Remember that the three dimensions matrix uh, tensor that we kind of um, already, I think we defined that somewhere at the top. Um, and then we can do some kind of scalar. So we take a scalar um, and we apply, say for instance, we add the value of two, so you're gonna take two and then add it to each one of the values um, in that particular. It's smart enough to know that it's gonna calculate that. So try to do that operation really nicely and it's gonna give you a result back to the same shape that is X. So those things you don't need to worry about. Um, and that's the great thing about these tools. They already support this. You don't really need to manually do it yourself. It knows how to, it figures out um, how to apply those operations properly. All right, so some reduction as well. Um, okay, so isn't it also preferred to use detach along with that? All right, so there's a question on detach. We're actually gonna talk about it in the context of, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some, con some concepts on calculus and you know when you have your, <clears throat> maybe want to detach something from a computation graph. Um, that's where it becomes really useful, but we'll talk about it later, not detach, detach function. It's pretty useful actually. All right, so, so reducing, right? So you see those summations, uh, maybe you want to do a sum of the elements in the vector, for instance, right? We have a vector X, right? This is a vector right here and we want to sum the elements, right? That's what, what's called a reduction. So you can see that it's reduced to zero, right? It's just summing all the elements. And those ones are really, really useful as well. You can see that all these things that we're covering here, they're gonna come back again. And that's why we, it's important to go to them, um, take this notebook and keep practicing on them and understand you know, how they work. So reduction applied to matrix. So we have a matrix as well. So this was a vector. We have a matrix. It's just gonna look at all those values and just you know, calculate the sum of the values um, of the elements in the matrix and it's just gonna give you a result, okay? Uh, nothing too special there. Um, you don't really need to understand what it's doing behind the scenes, right? Obviously, it has some kind of um, mechanism to make this an efficient operation, but that's not important here. The more important part is that you understand um, what it's doing and what it's operating. Okay, so <clears throat> reduction along axis zero. So, you know, sometimes you don't want to do some reduction uh, around a special axis. This is really, really, I've seen this a lot in, in a lot of code, um, especially for, you know, when you're doing the, uh, you know, when you have your predictions and you have your ground truth, and then you have, if you want to maybe do some kind of special calculation, a summation applied to something, something there, some, some, some resulting um, matrix or something like that, or tensor, you want to do some special kind of summation or reduction. And maybe you want to re reduce on a particular axis 
that that's really quite handy as well. So that's just a parameter that you pass to the sum. And you can see how it works here. Right, so axis sum, axis zero, uh, A sum axis zero. So you can see this one is on zero. So it's just gonna reduce this way, okay? Again, outer list, zero axis this way. Um, you can also do it, obviously you can do it in the other, the other way as well. So this one does it this way. So, you know, you're just gonna take that value, this row, do a reduction this way, and give you the result to six, do a reduction on the second row, give it a result, and it's just creating this um, for you. Um, sometimes it's quite useful to preserve the shape as well, right? So, so, so the shape becomes really important as well. And you can notice that when we did this reduction, we actually lose the, you know, the, 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 that dimension, right? In axis zero, we actually completely lost that. Sometimes you wanna preserve that. So I'll talk about it, how you can actually do that as well. All right, so reduction along with, with, the, with, the, with the axis, you can actually just provide those inside here. <clears throat> just another way to do it, right? So this one we saw, it, it's just this again. Right, and it's just another way to do it. Uh, beside the summation reduction, we have the mean, so quite useful as well. So we do a mean on that particular matrix, so you can see the result there. Right, it's just going to give you this kind of scalar value as well. So we went from a matrix to a scalar value. Just, just it's just mapping this to scalar. Value. Okay, so. Um, we want to do it some around some axis as well. Just look at that example; it's pretty quite similar to the sum. I just look at it; it should give you it should it should result in the in in the, in the results that you want. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Okay, we need to move with this one examples. Okay, so this is one that I was saying. Sometimes you want to keep the axis right, so you have the keep dims equal to. This is something that you typically see in code if you have seen it before. Um, I'm pretty sure you have if you have looked into some deep learning code. Um, the keep dims just saying I want to preserve that dimension because that dimension is quite useful for me to do some kind of extra operation. Uh, maybe that doesn't pertain to this particular matrix, but maybe this is something I want to infer that I can use to do some extra uh, operation, uh, maybe to something that I'm, uh, I'm calculating. That's quite useful. Oh yeah, so that's a great question. And this is how I started to do it, by the way. So, cause I started with NumPy, so I you know, created everything with NumPy code. And then I started to convert it into PyTorch. Um, uh, but again, I think it, 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 it all comes down to, uh, I think compatibility, cause I think if you use NumPy, right? It's kind of a, the, the, the native language here for all those matrix operations and this stuff. Um, Maybe it's, it, it is supported in some other tool, um, but you know, if there are other tools that you want to leverage that support only PyTorch, maybe somehow their things will break. So that's when you start to ask your question, right? You ask the question of whether you rely on other tools. If you're just doing like a very simple project, maybe you can um, you know, work with the two, because I've done it in the past, you can actually work with the two. And that's, uh, sometimes you, 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 you may want to do that. So before what I did as an example, so I used to use NumPy quite a lot, but I use NumPy a lot to do some kind of like padding, special padding. And I know NumPy has really nice functions for that. And PyTorch didn't really have functions for that at the beginning, right? But now it's, it's getting better. So I used to use NumPy and then I just kind of like, you know, did this. <laughs> I always try to make sure that um, uh, there was some compatibility there and between PyTorch and NumPy at least you have that compatibility. But as soon as you go into another um, and you rely on other maybe libraries, um, that's where things get tricky. Yeah, so they keep the mention. So notice with the, okay, let me go back to that example. That's quite important. So when I did this, this, uh, what, which one is it? Yeah, this summation, right? So when I did this summation on axis one, right? So we'll look at the, right, we're looking at A, this is A. And when we did a summation on axis one, so we take all these values, right? And we sum them and then we add them here. And so we are creating this kind of vector. So we take all the sums here and we, no, we take the sum of this and we add it here. The sum of this, we get it here. Right, so this this is going to end up with one, two, three, four, five. So we have five items, but when we did this, we lost that we lost the axis zero. So we lost the dimension, the first dimension. So sometimes you want to preserve that, right? So maybe maybe we can have those values instead of putting them into a vector like this. Uh, maybe we can put them into something like this. We have the same values, but then we have this dimension, the the dimension, the first dimension, which you know we preserve in this case. So it's the same operation on the same axis. It's just adding that keep things equal true and it's going to preserve it. It's going to do it this way. 
right? So hopefully that's useful. Yeah, I think the compatibility stuff, I think is quite a, a really interesting discussion. Um, but again, if you're doing a simple project, maybe that's, you know, that's not, 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 not so important and that's something to worry about. Uh, but if you move into production and you're relying on different uh, libraries that maybe don't have too much support for some of those like NumPy, maybe it becomes a little bit tricky there. So it depends. All right, so leverage broadcasting. Again, this was this, remember the broadcasting, we have our right matrix and we have a sum, right? The sum of A, um, we, we take those values and we kind of take each one of those rows and we do a division, right? So that's, that's quite useful, right? So you can see that the combination, so we do a keep names, which leads us to this. And then we do like a broadcasting, another operation that's going on behind the scene. We take advantage of that and we you know, get a resulting matrix that maybe could be useful for us. Um, so again, you can see how the, the, we're combining these different things. So it's quite useful to understand them individually as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's how that, it's, it's, just, it's just about fundamentals, just how that operation behaves, to how it should behave, right? So remember everything that we do here, all the operations have like, um, have their own formal definitions, right? So if you go into a Wikipedia and you put it up and you say, okay, you know, this, this, this multiplication has this a definition, it should look like this, the result should look like this, right? So we're following the same thing and these libraries are actually following that. But, you know, as, as we add this additional kind of functionalities, because sometimes those become pretty useful for us, right? For, for, for when training our models. Um, and so we need to do this additional work to, to get that. And so it's also about of efficiency, of course. And, and, and sometimes that's the reason why, um, you know, when we reduced it, that's the reason why sometimes you would get it as a vector as opposed to something like this. I so it sometimes it comes uh, with, with a price in terms of efficiency and computation here. Okay. Um, and, and one thing I would say, uh, one thing that I'm really, really excited about in terms of PyTorch. So there's a so-called profiler. I don't know if you'll look at it. I, I think I tweeted about this earlier on. I know TensorFlow has profiler for quite some time now, but I've seen that, you know, the, I've seen that the PyTorch team actually is spending some time in building these profilers. Profilers are exactly for this. If you don't understand what part of the code, you know, could be a bottleneck, what part of the code is using too much memory, that's what you use the profiler for. And it's quite easy to use. So I highly recommend you start to learn, learn about it as you play around with deep learning models, because um, you know, as a beginner, you want to get that insight, right? Sometimes you don't know what operation it's doing, how much memory this should take, or how much memory it's requiring. That's what you would do, you would use a profiler. So look into that. Okay, and maybe I, I think I will, I, will, I will have a session on that, not the entire session, but I will have it some, at some point in the future because I think it's quite important in terms of application, uh, particularly for PyTorch um, developers. So definitely I think I will have um, something about it later on as well. All right, so this is just a cumulative sum. You know, cumulative sum, like, it, it, like for those of you that study statistics and maybe are maybe data analysts, you know, cumulative sum is, is, is really nice uh, for maybe say doing like working with financial data and you want to do some, apply some smoothing function or something like that um, to, to your data. That's where you would use some kind of cumulative sum and, and you have other types of operations you, you can apply. So this one is just showing some, some example, right? So you have other different kind of operations you can apply here, but this is just, you know, if you want to do some differentiation or something like that as well. Uh, but this is a community sum. It's a very basic sample. It tells you, of course, we're going to take those values and we'll accumulate the, the sums of it. So what does that mean? So if you look at the zero, notice I'm on the, the axis, axis zero. So I'm going to go this way. So I'm going to go from zero, zero. So zero plus zero, zero. We don't have anything prior to this, this vector. So we you know just use those values and, and you see those values come in here. So now we're going to go to the second one, right? So we take those values and we add them. So we're accumulating the sums. So you can see how the operation is behaving here. So this is why I like to do it visually because you can understand what it's doing and later on, you will see how useful it is um, as an example. Yes, um, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe so um, for user, I don't know what's your name, but um, maybe later on, um, maybe I, don't, I, I wouldn't recommend you going to it right away to the profiler, um, just read about it, see what it is. I, I, I cannot promise, but maybe later on I want to introduce it. I, I think for a best practice, I think it's a really good, good, good tool to use, um, especially as you begin to play with, with PyTorch and deep learning models. So 
um, later on. I, I will try to see if I could get a reference and put it somewhere, um, or maybe even share it in, in our Slack group as well. I think, yeah, I think, I think it's the latest version, right? So it's the latest version. It should be with the latest version. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Somebody already shared it. That's it. All right. So, oh, okay. Let me take a little bit of water here. All right. So thanks for bearing with me. As I, then, as I said, um, you know, other, other tutorials would be a little bit better. They'll be more interactive, of course, um, because I'm going to get into models, right? But this one is just going through the, 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 the foundation here, the fundamentals and those different data structures and those operations that you can apply to them. So here we have another example. Um, we want that product is so important. So that product is used a lot. And actually you don't see it mentioned, but that's, that's basically what's kind of um, supporting uh, maybe, maybe operations between you know, what's going on in transformations in the deep learning model. So when you're transforming the data, um, you know, more than likely you have a dot product somewhere there. And so that's why it's really, really key to understand, um, you know, what it's doing and how it behaves and, and the intuition behind it. So, so far for this, I'm just going to show you what it does, right? So here, um, you know, the dot product is basically this sum over a product of elements. What does that mean? So we have two, the print X and print Y. So we, uh, we print them out first just to visually see what, what they're doing. And so, you know, you think, right, in this case, it's, it's, it's the dot product. So you're going to do like, you know, a product. So it's zero times one, one times one, two times one, three times one. And then you do a summation over them. So you get the six. That's going to be your dot product. So that's what it's doing, right? So you, you can, it's kind of like you're mapping vectors into a scalar value. So you know, similarly, you can do it with the sum, right? You can see there are different ways you can do this. And again, there's no, there's no like quick way to test which one is more efficient, which one should be used. And this is stuff like you have to experiment with. It all depends also on the size of the data that you're working with. Um, you know, someone, some of them may be more efficient than others, but note that you have different ways how you can solve it. And, and that's kind of like a, it's, it's, it's a pain point, so to speak, and also um, an advantage for developers. Now experienced developers, they like to have these different um, you know, ways, options of doing things. But you know, for someone that's starting, you see it, you're like, is this, is this the same as that, right? It's, it's like, you have different ways of doing this and codes, is, there's nothing standardized, right? You have different ways to do things. So that's a pain point, I think, for a learner. But again, it's just about testing. It's all about testing. You see the results are the same. So matrix vector product, again, now this one was about vectors uh, with a dot product, but you, know, you can have a matrix vector product as well. So you, know, you have a matrix, then you have a vector and you do some operation with it. Uh, previously, I showed you how to do this with uh, like a scalar, uh, but you can see here that it works really nicely. So you can do like a matrix vector using the MV. I don't see this used a lot, by the way, the MV. Um, what's I think more common um, is this one. It's just direct, like direct, directly saying explicitly what, it, what the operation is. And sometimes you will see it, but you know, they, 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 could, they could mean pretty much uh, you could do it. You could do it different ways, of course. All right. So that's the matrix vector. Then you have the matrix matrix. So you can see here we have um, no, no, maybe a B, and then you have something like this, and you you take in those matrices and you do a matrix multiplication. And here you go. That's the dot mmm dot mm. You put in your matrices and it gives you that. Okay, so that's just some multiplication there. Okay. All right, so norms and objectives. So this one will come back again. So we're gonna have a discussion about what norms are and you know what's the intuition behind them and how they apply in deep learning where they're used. They're used all over the place. Um, and that's just a concept that's discussed in linear algebra. That's a really, really, really um, foundational, I think concept in deep learning that's you know, adopted from linear algebra. So if you know, you're going to a book and one of those topics that you may wanna look into um, more deeper is norms and objectives. Why? Because objectives are usually, right, are usually um, are expressed as norms. So, you know, when you have an objective function, you will typically see norms there. So it's quite useful to know. 
Um, and that's regarding, of course, the optimization, which we haven't discussed, so we, we can't get into that topic yet, right? We have to discuss what optimization is. So that's why I say some of these things are better discussed when we actually talk about them later on. Um, so they will come back. And you always have this reference to get started with the basics and then you go back and forth here. But um, at least for now, just understand that and this will be used quite heavily you know, to define your functions, your objective functions. And it's quite a, a key concept in optimization. And actually it's used just to give you an idea. It's used um, also to do things like distance. You, know, you wanna calculate distance between vectors or something like that. Um, say something like word vectors. Um, that's, that's quite important there. Uh, used for regularization as well. So again, mentioning the, the, the word regularization, still haven't discussed what it is, how it applies in deep learning, um, but you know, those things will come later on and for feature selection as well. So if you wanna understand right away what it is, I would suggest you go into, let's see, ah yeah, I have a really nice blog post that I bookmarked quite a, quite a, a few months back. Um, take a look at that. If you're not afraid of math, look into it. It explains really with some great examples uh, what's this idea of norms. Obviously, if you get lost, um, don't worry about it too much because you will see how it's being applied later on as well. So it's just, it's just to get an idea. So you have the, so here we have, of course, um, I'm, I'm just telling you what it is, right? So it's the magnitude of components, um, but you can see how it's used in, 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 in PyTorch. You have a tensor, you apply some norm. It's pretty easy to apply it. It gives you some, some scalar, right? So again, it's a mapping function. You have some tensor, you map it to some scalar value. Um, you have the L2 norm and L1 norm, and we will get into the discussion of what's the difference between the two, because I think that's something that people ask a lot. Um, but that, that discussion needs to be done in the context of the optimization and this sort of things that we're gonna discuss later on as well. So it's, it's not, not the time yet to discuss it um, because it, it could lose people here. So that's coming up. I think that's an important discussion to have. Um, it's important to understand the intuition behind it, uh, you know, what, where one is applicable and where one is more advantageous than the other one. Um, and of course, you know, you have L2 norm, you could have L3, whatever. It's really, gen it generalizes, um, so, yeah. Um, then you have the Frobenius norm as well. Um, again, this one is discussed in the context of weight decay. Uh, again, this is another discussion in the context of, of, of um, optimization, right? Um, and that's why it's, it's quite hard to actually talk about it right away uh, because we haven't got into that topic yet, but it will come for sure. So I really, I, I think I like, I like these, these, these ideas with the norms um, and having a discussion around it, a deeper discussion around it. So that's something I kind of took a note of because people have been asking me about it. So I think we, sh we should definitely talk about it. All right, calculus. What's calculus about? So we, lead, we, did, uh, so we did linear algebra where we covered some, a few concepts. Um, I think the norms are quite, quite important there. There are other things that I kind of miss as well, the dot product really important. Um, and then let's, let's talk a little bit about calculus and, and how this applies in deep learning, right? In the context of deep learning, it, it comes back to the optimization again, right? It's about optimization. How, how deep learning is, right? And how it differentiates from the classical machine learning. You're doing this kind of broad propagation step, you know, propagating some kind of um, results and you're tweaking some kind of parameters till you eventually you know, come up with a highly predictive model. That's, that's what you're aiming to do. And so in order for you to achieve that, you need to know, you need to apply some, some ideas from calculus where you really need to define some kind of optimization algorithm for that. And you know, calculus is gonna help you for that. So just to give you an idea on, on, on you know, what really is used from calculus and that's the derivatives. So there's a step obviously in the algorithm where you're aiming to, so you have, imagine you have this neural network, very, very basic neural network where you have your input coming in and you have this loss, right? And as we said in the first chapter, the loss is basically de gonna determine how good or bad this model is actually performing. But, you know, just having that value, is not so useful. What you wanna do is, you know, back propagate um, that particular, whatever, whatever the function gave you that output and then do some kind of, um, do some kind of differentiation on that uh, to get some, 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 some gradients. And that gradients will give you, basically it's a key here because it will give you kind of the, the, 
maybe steepest direction, right? So it's kind of like a, it's like a slope. So it's give you the steepest direction. Once you have that, then you can take like something like a learning rate and you tell it, you know, how far you want to go into that direction where you are basically you know, kind of optimizing as you go along, right? <clears throat> So that's like a high level explanation of what it is. I know maybe it, it, it confuses some of you, but um, that's kind of the general idea of, of how derivatives apply here. And sometimes you talk about gradients. So gradients is just like doing this concatenation of the partial derivatives. Again, all the stuff, we're gonna talk about it later on as we start to apply them. Um, but that's what we're doing here. That's the idea of this. And I, will, I would recommend you to take a look at the multivariate function section in particular, because that's the one used. Mo mostly we are dealing with composite functions. So functions, you know, maybe you have a function that that's, within a, that's within another function that's very common. So you're kind of chaining functions um, in deep learning. So this concept of multivariate function, if you, you know, can open up a book and try to understand some of the rules of calculus that apply here, please do so. It, it will become very handy and you will understand things a lot more clear. So this one in particular, I would suggest um, that you take a look at. So yeah, I just provided some like my summarized version of what you know what I how I understand derivatives and how they apply, right? And you know the gradient descent algorithm, how it uses this concept um, to, to to kind of um, to use that gradient, you know, uh, maybe uh, apply some kind of uh, infinitesimally, like small amount, like those are the those are your parameters, right? So you want to like in, here I'm saying increase it or decrease it a bit, um, and, and, and that will give you that will give you some result um, that tells you in what direction you should you know, be going, um, and that ensures that you, you know you're optimizing um, your algorithm. So again, we'll discuss this later on. So I don't want to get into too much details here, but that was my um, intuition here. And of course, the bad propagation algorithm is what will be implemented here to do that. If you really want to get an idea of all of this stuff that I just said with calculus and derivatives, this is the number one, I think, resource I would, I would recommend. And that's the reason why I kind of created this notebook, right? So I developed this notebook. I adopted the code from Andre Karpati. So I took all the different code segments, which were in I think they were in JavaScript and I converted them into Python. Uh, Python. I did this quite a while back. I'm not sure when I did this, but when I was getting started, I think this was so key for me to understand, um, you know, getting ready for interviews, understanding how to become, I think there's a, I really like this concept, how to become a bad propagation ninja or something like that. And that's quite useful and very important. I mean, going into an interview, you want to understand what bad propagation is. It's kind of the key concept in, in deep learning and why it works. So I think it's quite useful to understand it. And I really, really, I think this, this is the one of the resources that I really highly recommend. I've always been wanted to, to, to make it open and put it online. I think a few folks have done their own versions of it, um, but I, you know, I haven't provided like descriptions of it. I just, this is just my way of studying, but I think it's quite useful to understand, um, you know, the partial derivatives and how you do bot propagation, how it's used, um, how, how those different rules are used. And so when you have different functions, what are those operations to get your partial derivatives and what are the rules you're applying, right? So there are many rules, right? Your chain rule, your quotient rule, your product rule, all these different, some rules, all these different rules that are in calculus. Um, and get familiar with those. So this is what I was saying here. Make sure you understand those. Those become really important um, as we go along. Okay, um, this, I'm gonna drink a little bit of water because, hmm. Yeah, I'm going to share that. That's if you if you if you don't feel comfortable when you went through the chapter, I think the chapter it's more like a high level introduction of calculus. In my, in my opinion, um, you can definitely go deeper. You can definitely go deeper than this, um, and you should go deeper if you want to understand those things, um, the back propagation. So that's why I think this one will be really key for you, and I want to share that with you. <clears throat> All right, so. Yeah, just to give an idea. So all of these things that I was talking about, the gradient descent, you know, the partial derivatives, and who, are you, who you actually come up with those partial, those, those, those gradients, which are kind of the more important ones, um, you know, using the chain rule. Um, at the end of the day, you don't really need to do this manually. And that's the reason why when you do take courses online, and uh, you take some deep learning course, you know, those instructors, they don't really take the time to go through these things, which I think are important to understand. 
But in order for you to apply deep learning, you don't really need that stuff because that stuff is already being done for you. And, and, and by the way, it's, 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 it's kind of error free. So if you, if you, if you are going to do this manually, you can do it manually and you can see the examples there. And I, give, I have more examples here, uh, but that stuff, you know, can become error prone pretty easily. That's not, that's not something you, you can do easily. Um, and you know, a mathematician will tell you that's the case. So uh, just be aware of that. Okay. So we have those tools like PyTorch, TensorFlow, which can do that automatic differentiation for us and allows us to, you know, focus on the you know, developing our, our models and you know, setting up the different building blocks. And we don't need to go through all that stuff. It's just a one call through a back prop and it does all the calculation of the gradients for you. And it tells you, you know, exactly what direction um, you now we should go in that particular function so that we kind of, you know, minimize that loss. We'll get back to that again, again, in the context of uh, when, when, when we are, I think the second chapter, if it's not the second chapter or the third chapter, we will get back to the prop propagation again. We're gonna have a whole section on that. So this is a computation graph. I read about this if you haven't, there are some books that talk about this as well, computation graph. Um, you know, all these toolkits, they're, de they're, depending on, they're depending on computation graphs at the end of the day. Uh, this is not just some code that you put together pretty easily. No, it's actually a computation graph behind the scenes. And I really like this image from Chris Ola. Like Chris Ola is like a researcher openly I know. He does these really beautiful visualizations um, and, and, and it describes what a computation graph is. It's just like these different operations that are in a, like in a graph. Right, and then and, and at some point, maybe in the graph, you want to like do some kind of back propagation so to, to, to get your gradients, which are kind of really key here, as I said, um, and, and how do you do that, right? So you, you, this data structure actually um, a, a allows uh, toolkits like PyTorch to efficiently compute those, those gradients, which are key here. Um, so that's the reason why uh, the computation graph um, is quite a key, to a key concept to understand. Um, however, it's, that, it's not really discussed heavily in the, at, at least in this chapter that I look, maybe later on it's discussed. I haven't looked in the, like in the later, later chapters, but if it doesn't, maybe I'll have to bring it up back in these two chapters here. Um, but I think it's really important because that's actually, you know, it's a data structure that's used and, and it's really important to know so that you understand every operation that you do, every function that you apply, you are doing that in the context of a, of a graph here. So let's, let's go through some code here. Um, so, so some examples, right? I have the, I have this one. I think maybe I would suggest you to go through this one first. So I will upload both of them. So the only thing I would have to say, I will apologize for not having like more descriptions about it. Cause I, you can see that I don't have descriptions, but what I would say is that you can actually, if you need the descriptions is basically this one, right? So it's from Andre Karpati, the hacker's guide to neural networks. Um, you know, he claims that this is a very old tutorial, you know, maybe you don't want to use it, maybe you want to just, um, it shouldn't be referenced, but I think this is such a, it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful um, article, beautiful tutorial, of, in my opinion, because it has some intuition, you know, he uses his physics because he has a physics background and he explains what's going on. And I think from a physicist, physicist perspective, I think they're really good at explaining this. Um, and those intuitions that he builds here is quite useful. He gives a lot of examples. You know, what's a derivative? You know, what, what, what do we mean by a gradient, right? And, and why are we tweaking things? And why should we tweak? And what directions should these, you know, <clears throat> tweaks? How do we determine the direction and so forth? So it really explains to you, right, the different strategies that you use to actually, um, you know, get those gradients and what are the rules you use. So please take a look at the descriptions here. And combine that, you know, so, so if you look at the code, right? So it's, if you're good with JavaScript, you know, you don't want to have a problem. But if you're not good with JavaScript and you're only using Python, then that's the reason why I kind of created this notebook. So they just, just com they, they complement each other, I guess. Um, again, I'll credit to, to Karpati. I think he, he really, he, he know what he was doing here. And as this is really important stuff. Okay, so just going to go through so, a few examples here. I'm at almost one and a half hours now. So I'm gonna go through some quick examples, the stuff you can always go try on your own. So this one is the, right, so we have some function that we wanna differentiate. You can see here, you have a function uh, uh, it's, 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 it's with respect to the, um, 
the, the column vector X in this case. So let's just do that. So you can see we have a, like a simple vector. Um, and this one is explained to you uh, again with the problem with memory allocation. So when you cal calculate derivatives, maybe you don't want to you know, create one single, um, do different copies of this. Maybe you just want to keep one copy going. Um, so I, I always keep that in mind, okay? <clears throat> There's more explanation to this on the, on, the, on the book. I think they explained it really well, but that's something I want to br bring up again because it comes up again and again. Um, so this one ensures that, right? It, the requires grad um, tells it that you know, at some point, this is going to be part of some kind of computation graph and we probably need to do some, uh, when we do the back propagation at some point, uh, we, we, it's going to require those gradients. So let's do that. You can see here, I'm just quickly doing this. So we have the, so when we do this one, what does that mean? So this is basically means this, right? So we're doing the, again, the <clears throat> calculating the gradient of Y with respect to X. And maybe that doesn't make that much sense for you, but I'm pretty sure you will have time to look at the notebook that, I, that I'm gonna share with you and you're gonna understand what it is. So that's what it means. When you do that here, really it's just gonna, uh, it's just gonna calculate the value of none. Now it hasn't done anything special yet, right? In the graph, uh, in the computation graph. So now as you, as you add your, you know, you add another step. So the next step is you're gonna, you're gonna set up this function Y and you're gonna make that uh, as a, so you're gonna say, uh, you know, you wanna provide that those X values. So now this is, um, um, that's a function of X, right? So you can see here we have uh, kind of a constant and then we have this dot product when you actually, you know, calculate this, it gives you, so I think it gives you 14 and then you times it by two is gonna, you could see what the result of Y is. So again, it's like a computation, it's a, it's a graph. And at some point you want to get that gradient, right? So you're going to say, okay, in this competition graph, I'm more, more interested in getting that gradient of, of Y and in deep learning, usually you do that typically with the loss function, right? That's your loss function. And you do it with respect to the parameters. But in this simple example is just doing it with respect to X. So how do you get that? Well, all you do is just do the Y backward and that does the calculation of the gradients for you. So you don't really need to do it, right? So that's the beauty of it. Um, and that stuff is just standard, uh, you know, across the table. So that's something everyone uses. And of course, when you get the, oops, something I didn't do here. Oh, uh, let's see. Maybe I got something. Okay, there you go. So how does this work, right? So when we actually do, um, you know, calculate the gradient of that function with respect to X, um, that should be for X. So if you know your, your rules, right? So we have the rules. If you go to the rules, um, uh, we, take the, we take this particular one and then we say, you know, that's gonna be, uh, so that's, a, that's an, kind of look like an X squared. Um, so we take the degree, we multiply it by this um, coefficient here. It's gonna give you four, so it's gonna give you four X. We always do a minus. If you look at it, what am I talking about? Let me just take you back here. And that's why the, the, the rules are quite important because I mean, they're covered here extensively, I believe. So this is the one we're using right here, okay? That's the one we're using. So that's how we get to four X. And obviously if we plug in the values, right? We plug in the values of the vector X, which is just zero, one, two, and three. Um, we plug them in here. It gives you these values. So this is the resulting, um, those are the resulting uh, numbers that we get, right? So with the, with the X at grad. So those are, our, our gradients with respect to the to, 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 to x component of it, each component in x. All right, so that's the example. I think it's a basic example. I actually prefer, so I actually created another example. It's a tutorial I shared uh, quite a few uh, months back as well, because I was trying to explain this to like a, you know, like an audience. Um, I, I actually wrote an example of it. And I adopted this one from the from the Python. So the Python that we have some tutorials as well that give you ID, uh, basics to automatic differentiation. So take a look at that one in in, in PyTorch, the website. Uh, there's some tutorial about this. Um, I think I used one of their examples. I even wrote down um, how I derived with the with the gradients and so forth. And you know how did I apply it <clears throat> when I plug in the values? I get that. Um, and that's really nice because this example is quite basic. Um, yeah, I'm selling an operation and I try to make it in the context of so something like an out, which is going to be your output. <laughs> like, 
I try to make it in that context just to make people understand. And basically what I was doing is just, you know, calculating the gradients with respect to the X. Again, this in, in deep learning, you're doing that with respect to the, uh, your parameters. So just take a look at those examples. I think they're quite nice to understand what it's doing. And I think the Python tutorial is great for that. So I may, I may, I may share a link or two on, on maybe where, where you should look at to understand these concepts a bit more. Because I think the book does provide some, some basic examples, but um, maybe there are some more advanced examples that will give you some more ideas on this one. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, I don't know, it's quite hot in Amsterdam today. <laughs> it's, I'm sweating here. It's really, really, really hot. It's, hot. it's hard to concentrate as well. I don't know if you notice, but it's really, really hard to concentrate. Um, yeah, so just go through the examples. This one, uh, this one is, I think this one is quite interesting. Let me see if I can go through one more here. Um, yeah, I think this one I found really interesting. A very simple example, by the way, you see how here we have a grad zero, right? Um, you know, if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not explicit, it's going to accumulate screenings. Um, and maybe we need to clear it, right? So we clear it because, of course, uh, on the next round, maybe when you're training your model, you don't really care about those ones in the past. Maybe you only care about the ones in this time step. So what you do is just clear it out. And then you, you, you in your computation, graph, imagine your computation graph, you have this new, fun this new function, y, right, of x, and then you have x, which is just a summation. And I think if you know your rules, um, the derivative of a sum is just equal to the sum of the derivatives. It's quite confusing. If you want an example, you can take a look at that. But basically, it's just the derivative of that linear term, which is x, right? So the result is going to be 1, 1, 1, which is kind of really interesting. But that's the result that you get. Um, those are your gradients, 1, 1, 1, 1. So I'll do this backward, squared. Um, yeah, that's the result. I think, yeah, that's the other interesting one. This is just more a continuation of, I, I think, a continuation of that. Oh, I think this one is great as well, um, because this one is just talking about um, some things that need to be tweaked, right? Because uh, this field is not about this stuff that we're talking about. You know, it's, it's, it's not like deep learning, right? This is something else. This is calculus. Um, and sometimes we need to tweak things a bit, right? So we have our formal definition in mathematics, but here we kind of tweak things in our library uh, to get us where, where we want. So, you know, some interpretation, natural interpretation of the, when you're differentiating a vector, right? With respect to some vectors, it will give you a matrix. That's the formal definition. But what we want is we don't really care about what the result is because at the end we want to back propagate. But so what we want, maybe what to do, what to do here is maybe we just want to reduce this to a scalar value. And so that is what PyTorch is expecting, at least when it's doing the backward propagation, right? Because of course, this is deep learning. We're you know, mapping, <clears throat> we have this function that maps you know, to some particular scalar value and that's the value we're interested in. And so we need to find a way to pass it um, to, 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 to your backward uh, function. So you always do like a sum. And then once you do that, then you know, everything works out quite nicely. So just that, I think the book explains it really well as well. Um, something to really to keep in mind. But when you apply it, to be honest, when you apply it in the, uh, with the, I think future examples, you're not going to see this ever again. I think this is all taken care of. We're never, you know, going to have a situation where we have this sort of things. Um, and if, if we do have the case, maybe there are some functions that we can take advantage of that does this for us. And we don't need to do it. You know, we don't need to do it manually. But I was good to know. Ooh. Yeah, and then I was saying here is more like <clears throat> doing the, uh, partial derivatives individually. So the derivatives of the last function, and then you kind of, you can sum them, um, right? So you're calculating your, 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 your last function, sum them. And that's, that's the value that you're interested in, right? So that, that's summation, that total. All right, so, okay. Wow, it's quite, quite hot in here. All right, so yeah, that's 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 about it. I think for for these examples, there's another example here. This one is more about detach. Somebody was talking about uh, a de detach. Again, this only makes sense in the context of the computation graph. Right? When you have a computation graph, you can actually kind of visualize this in your mind how it's actually. Uh, so as an exercise, I would say just go through each one of the like you know, operations, put it, plug them in like in a computation graph, and you will understand very very easily what's going on here. So sometimes maybe um, like for this one. Right, so the y, so we have our y is equal to x. I think that example is already up here. We know how it works. But you know, sometimes we have this extra variable that we're really interested in. And maybe you know, our final function here 
actually depends on that variable. But if you do it this way and you just you know assign that to y without the detach, without de detaching that value, um, it actually takes this into consideration. So now it becomes x times x and x instead of the u times x, which is what you're interested in. So that's why I think the computation graph conversation makes sense because you want to maybe detach this one um, no, for that particular uh, that particular point in time, and then you know. <clears throat> Um, so when you're doing this, instead of doing the x-axis, it's going to be ux, which is just the value of y. So all that stuff is already baked into y. So in this particular case, it's just going to be, you know, the calculation that you get from x, uh, this multiplication between those, um, the, the vector x. So that calculation is just this right here. So I printed out without the u, this right, right here. And so now, knowing your rules, if you're doing some backward propagation, you're calculating the gradients with respect to, in this case, uh, let's see, with respect to x, right? So if you know your rules, your calculus rules, um, when you have this kind of product, it's basically, you know, returning, in this case, it's going to return back to you. So if you do um, another partial, so doing calculate the gradient of this particular function, z, with respect to with respect to x, it's just going to return this one. It just gives you back you. And that's quite nice because that's something that is explained in this particular notebook. Um, you will understand exactly what I'm talking about as you go through the examples. Um, and that's it, right? When you check the, <clears throat> when you check the, the, the gradients at the end, right, the gradients here, and then you kind of check it with you, right? That's what you get. So you get back you, right? So here with this really funny looking function here, you get back you as I said, right? Because this is one is with respect to X. So you get back the U and then, you know, the gradients that you get at the end of the day, you know, it's pretty similar to the U. So you can see here, I print them, I print out both of them. So I X grad and print U and they're the same. You can see here, that's quite cool. The very basic example, it shows you exactly what's going on. So I'll take a look at this one. Um, I challenge you to take a look at this one. The uh, PyTorch uh, tutorial has, I don't know if they have removed it or they have kept it, but they have a really interesting one. They walk you through a lot of the math behind it. Um, you know, and it's a little bit more advanced example like, like I'm showing here. Okay, uh, let's see. Any questions? Whew. All right, so what are, what are, so some questions here specifically about, Yeah, I would suggest, I know some folks are a little bit confused already. So I would suggest, no, I think these examples are really high level. Um, what I would suggest if you don't, if you don't understand this stuff, right? If you don't understand what's going on with the different rules and how they apply, I would just strongly suggest you to go through this notebook. It, it really makes a lot of sense to go through it and spend the time understanding um, the explanations and the intuitions behind it. And because it does talk about all the different rules. And so you, you, you get a function and with it, every function that you get, you always apply a different rule, right? So the functions will look very different. And especially in deep learning where we have this kind of composite functions, it gets a little bit more difficult to actually uh, manually do this. And that's why it's beautiful to have this automatic um, differentiation capabilities. All right, so um, yeah, I think I'm coming to an end here. Um, I have one just explanation about probability. I think this one is the only one that I couldn't like fit really nicely here because um, we haven't even spoken about the, we want to create, want to establish a predictive model at the end of the day, right? We have all these different uh, pieces of the puzzle that we still have to talk about and the probability um, and it's used, something that's used towards, um, towards the end of creating the model. And, and we're kind of trying to compare um, <laughs> what the model is predicting and trying to understand what rules apply here and this sort of thing. So we have all the different axioms of probability. I think the book discusses them very slightly, not so much in depth, uh, but I think the book does a really good job already. Um, I don't think you really need to know like all the distributions and this stuff. It really doesn't apply um, in deep learning. Although for you know your classical machine learning, maybe there are a few concepts there that do apply um, so all, all of these things, you know, just, 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 just be very uh, patient with it. I think as we move along, I will start to make some more suggestions, very specific suggestions about where to spend time on you know, some particular subjects and, 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 you know, where these things do matter, like conditional probability and so forth. Uh, but the book does have some examples towards the appendix and how to, 
um, to understand these things, what kind of analysis you can do. Um, on your random barrels, for instance. <sighs> okay. Yeah, I just had some examples here. Mostly what I wanna talk about is that, um, this is from the book, of course. Um, I think the book towards the end has, let's see uh, here. I would, I do have one example, which I would like you to take a look at that. Really, really, really interesting. So when I started right with, with, with machine learning, um, I had to actually implement uh, a naive Bayesian, <laughs> a naive Bayesian method. Um, to, to do a classifier, a very simple sentiment classifier on tweets. And, and I used this and I, I, found it, I found it really, really, really interesting that the authors of this book actually spent some time, actually spent the time to provide an example using PyTorch on how to apply naive Bayesian for something like classification. Um, that's not typically seen in other books, to be honest, but I really like that because there's a lot of um, foundations here that is, are quite useful to understand, right? So like the conditional independence where that, where that applies in terms of learning and, and establishing a predictive model. So go through this example, although you probably won't see it again throughout the book, I think it's quite useful to go through the example and to realize that Sometimes to you know, implement a model, sometimes you don't really need to go too advanced. You don't even need to go into deep learning. Something as basic as this, you can actually get some really good results. Um, yeah, I think this is quite useful. So go through this. I think this one is the one I would recommend. And then there's other, uh, all those distributions which probably are not so relevant, but we're gonna talk about those later on too, so. Yeah, so this one was more about the die rolls. Like there were some examples and how you can use the, the distribution, right? You have a multinomial here and <clears throat> you want to do some samples and because you're, you don't have, so you're, you're not dealing with the true probabilities. You're basically just doing an estimation. Um, it tells you how you can actually kind of uh, simulate this, right? If, if you have like a, like a like six, you know, six sided die, um, and maybe you want to roll it and you want to um, calculate some probabilities there um, using some kind of distribution. Of course, uh, here it tells you how you can use this function. So, you know, this one, I think, yeah. So this one is just giving you um, the probabilities. Of course, it's six-sided, so just that divided by six. And then you can actually do a sample. So you can do a sample with this one. Um, and you can see that this one, one, three, four, right? So it's, uh, for this particular role, there was, uh, we saw a four in the die. And you can actually do this multiple times. So you can actually increase it to 10. So now it's 10 times. And it tells you here, this one is the one um, that came up the most, right? It's represented by a multinomial uh, distribution, of course. Um, but yeah, you can see. <clears throat> and then, yeah, of course, because again, it's an estimate. So what you would use, right, to, 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 to calculate those probabilities uh, you will use the rel relative frequency. So all you do is just divide it by the 1,000. So in case you're doing 1,000, maybe this could just be a parameter here, um, right? So it's 1,000 um, 1000 rolls, as you were saying. You just take the counts and you divide it by 1,000 and then it gives you here um, your distribution. So these are all the different probabilities. Okay. Right, so this is just a more sophisticated example. It's actually in the book. Um, you know, what happens, uh, let's say you want to do, maybe you want to do, uh, maybe do it more groups of experiments, right? So we have, that's very typical with experiment, when you're experimenting with machine learning models, you want to do more groups of experiments. And here it tells you it's going to draw a 10 for each group. So you can see that the 10 here for each group. And then at some point that should converge to those probabilities that we saw earlier, right? So the, let's see, this ones, that's more closer. Kind of estimating to the true probability, so you can see here at the bottom, uh, that's what you see with as as you go more, uh, in, you know, with the groups of experiments, as you run more experiments, you can see how it's going there. So that's really beautiful to see. Um, again, this stuff like it would only make sense when you're starting talking about modeling and this sort of things and where it applies. But this is just to show you like some fundamental stuff, and you know what, what what's going on with these functions. But I think it's, it's highly unlikely that we will do something like this in our, when you're training our deep learning models. This is more stuff like for theory, if you really wanna 
you know, dive deep a, a bit deeper and want to get comfortable with it with the language, I think that would be useful. Yeah, I mean the if Bayesian, yeah, it's it's quite effective, right? But there are some assumptions that you have to take into account, of course. Um, with all these things, there's always some assumptions. That's very really quite important. And then linear regression, you you actually learn about this, right? That's why I think the book has a nice structure. Sometimes, you know, a linear regression model will give you good results. And I'm quite excited that we're moving more into like this realm where we're, we, we just, everything is deep learning. Because when I do used to do experiments back in the days, um, a linear you know, regression or a naive Bayesian typically gives you really good results. And I was always comparing to these models. Whatever I was doing, I was always using these models as baselines and, and then trying to do comparison of results. But nowadays, most people are telling you, you know, that's why we're here. That's why we want to learn about deep learning because people are um, kind of kind of obsessed about deep learning. <laughs> and you know, they, they quite, they, they're quite um, useful for, for some sort of applications where you have large data sets. So that's why it's, that's why it's important to, to learn it too. All right, so I think that'll be it. Um, I want to open the floor 15 minutes. If you want to have a discussion, I'll be, I'll be open to that. Um, any questions that you may have, um, anything about the, the program, how it's going, feedback as well, I would I really appreciate that. Um, so a anything that you, you would like to share, I'll you know I'll open the floor to, to, to you all. So any feedback, how is it going? Do you like the, the speed, the tempo? Um, let me know, please let me know. That's, that's really gonna help me because um, obviously this stuff, I'm just introducing things. I'm starting to introduce some things that are important, um, but I think you know, as, we, as, as we move forward with the, with the book, uh, you will start to see those things that you came to see, which is those models, right? And how they apply with different types of data sets. Uh, but the foundations are quite important, and that's something that I do emphasize on. I'm quite passionate about learning the foundations. Um, you know, if you want to take a research route in deep learning, I think this is a really useful book for that. Although, you know, it's not it's not exhaustive as I would like it to be. But you know, we're going to talk about that. We're gonna I'm going to provide you as much references that have helped me, you know, over over time, and things like this notebook here that I have that I want to really share badly. Um, I think will be. Uh, very useful for you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, I, I, thank you for bearing with me. I, I, it's such a hot day in Amsterdam today. I don't know, this, these past few weeks, it, it typically is really cold in Amsterdam, but these past few weeks has been super, super hot, very unusual, but uh, I'm surviving. And I really enjoyed it. Yeah, the group chat was amazing. Thanks everyone for participating there. Yes, please. Thanks, uh, Taina, for reminding. So what's the next step? There's no assignment. I don't want to like put an assignment here or obligate you to do an assignment. What I would like you to do is to go through those notebooks. So all those notebooks, you know, this one, Naive Bayesian, go through it. Don't ignore it. It's quite useful. It's, it's, it's a brilliant notebook, I think. It's a brilliant, just click on that. It's brilliant. I, I really love this because this is the stuff that I was doing before getting into deep learning. Um, you know, it talks a little bit about the data set, but that doesn't matter. It's just the concept really is quite useful. Um, sometimes, you know, all you need is just a naive Bayesian method, <laughs> machine learning model, and that's it. But it's quite useful. But yeah, the appendix is really nice. I think um, at least for what we want to, uh, the concepts that will come up in, in this like future chapters, I think this is quite enough, right? So all the additional stuff that I provided for you is that if you want to go deeper, if you really want to like explore a bit more and you don't know where to go, I think those steps are quite nice. Um, and that, that, that content is quite useful for that. Okay, so the pace seems okay. Hopefully it's not too slow. Some people have been, been telling me it's quite slow. I wanna go faster. Um, however, I don't wanna take that approach. I think there are courses out there and there are other lecturers that actually do it. Um, and obviously this is not a course, but um, I'm just sharing because I always wanna share this stuff and I didn't find a way to share it. And, and I think this is one way for me to share quite easily and actually push myself as well, because I could get pretty lazy to, to, to like say develop an opal like this, which I know could help like a lot of people, but I don't force myself to do it because I don't have that obligation. But having this, you know, 
this kind of bi-weekly stuff is going to force me to share the stuff at the end of the day, which I do want to share, by the way, don't get me wrong, but I've never seemed to have the time to, to, to put that content together and share it. So it's going to be good. So hi, Elvis. Um, thank hi. You, first of all, thank you for um, uh, like taking us on this journey with you so that we all can learn together. Sure. Um, I had a question regarding um, MXNet itself. Um, so I have used PyTorch and TensorFlow. Um, could you sh shed some light on what is the advantage or disadvantage of MXNet over the other two? So MXNet, I haven't used it, to be honest. I haven't used MXNet before. Um, I mostly have used TensorFlow and PyTorch. I could, I could talk a little bit about, you know, where one is better than the other. Um, but that's, that's like a whole discussion. I even made a talk about this. One thing I, I do like about PyTorch and why I decided to go, you know, this direction, because uh, I think it's really great for people that are getting started. Um, it, 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 is, it is the case that it was developed for researchers and, and, and don't take that for granted because most of the, the functionalities that you see are quite easy to use. Um, I think for learning, it's a great learning tool. But now you, days you start to see like PyTorch getting really, really serious about, you know, trying to allow some kind of, or being part of the ecosystem where people are putting these things into production. Because that's something, you know, PyTorch have locked for quite some time and now it's kind of getting there. So the difference with, with TensorFlow is that TensorFlow actually has that already, already has a community, already has yeah. like, hubs or you can download models, you can use it. You don't have that with PyTorch. So that's kind of a little bit difference here. So I think for people that are getting started, PyTorch is, is, is what I would recommend. Um, and I think PyTorch and TensorFlow are quite very similar in, in the way they function now. Um, I don't know if they have fundamentally changed, but I think it's, it's, they, they were quite similar as, as far as I know. Yeah, that's true. Especially yeah. with TensorFlow 2 uh, kind of adopting um, like an easier approach rather than the previous ones. Um, yeah. it, it is quite similar to PyTorch now. That's yeah, and, and one thing I really like that, uh, with the conversation about compatibility, sometimes you want to download a model, right? So sometimes you want to maybe say, use some kind of like uh, sentence embeddings, you want to download a model. Um, you can do it from the hub, from TensorFlow hub, and then you can easily, you know, take that and transform it pretty easily into something like, like NumPy objects or like Python, even Python. So they're kind of like compatible with each other. So I started to see more of that, which is quite useful to see. So that means, you know, your investment in learning about PyTorch or even something like MXNet, um, I think it makes sense, right? It doesn't really matter which one you take because at the end of the day, um, you know, people are working you know, towards creating tools that work and are, work, work, work with these different um, uh, toolkits. So I think we're, we're, in good, we're in good hands with the developers of these toolkits. Thank you. Sure. Any other question? But if you want to use MXNet, go ahead and do so. Like, for those of you that are going to submit assignments later on, this is, there is no assignment this time, but um, if even your project you can do an MXNet, go ahead and do, feel free to do so. There's, there's nothing that would, should stop you here. I'm just using for the educational stuff, I'm using PyTorch because it's much easier for me. Um, if I want to use MXNet, I probably have to learn a few things, but I think I've seen it, like at a glance, I think it's quite similar. It's quite similar to NumPy. It's actually just, you know, it's a higher level library around NumPy, which PyTorch is the same here. So maybe the function names are different, but I think it's doing quite the same thing. And that's why the book has, well, the book is actually applicable <laughs> to all the tools, because again, it's just like theory, and then you have the examples, and, and somehow the text that's written applies to, to all the cases, which is something really good to see. Yeah, so, yeah, so MXNet, really good. I've heard this one with the multi-GPUs. I know PyTorch users have struggled with this one um, being able over, or the, over the past months. I think people are working on this. Um, I've seen different efforts from companies like Microsoft and NVIDIA as well, um, trying to make uh, PyTorch a little bit more friendly with um, those, those, the hardware, like multiple, like setting up a multiple GPU or something like that, which is TensorFlow is really good at already from, from the get-go. Um, but you know, you're, you start, you will start to see some improvements for sure in PyTorch. So don't just disregard it just yet. <laughs> I think it's, it's getting there, um, in terms of production stuff, but at, at the moment, I think for learning, I think it's quite useful and, you know, it's getting better, uh, for putting th stuff into production as well. And I know people are using it already. Okay, since you're talking about production, will you talk about how the machine learning deep learning model 
uh, being deployed, train managing production infrastructure. So we have, this should be, because ideally what we want to do um, with a project is not just do a project to show, but a project to actually display. So one thing, and I'm really glad you actually brought up this question. So you coming into this study group, I don't want to feel like you're wasting your time. One thing I would encourage you to do is to, you know, the, the first report that you submitted or people that are submitting a report, for instance, um, try to find a way to record that stuff, like record that stuff somewhere on your GitHub or something like that, or even a blog if you want. Because I, I saw some really good reports, which is get me really, really enthusiastic about this whole stuff because I saw some really, really good reports. And I think it's quite useful to encourage yourself uh, to, to, to create a log out of these things. You know, when, you, when maybe later on you want to show or you showcase that you actually went through this learning and, you know, you have done some kind of coursework as well, um, it's good to show, right? It's good to show in your resume. It's good to, to tell people that you have went through this. And that's the reason why I wanted to do this, to encourage people to do that and push yourself to do that. And so in terms of the production stuff, I do think we will have a chance, especially for the project, and I will try to do sessions about this um, somehow in between um, for us to try to put things into production, right? So what it, does it mean to put things into production? What are the things that matter? You know, how you observe a model, right? The MLOps stuff, like people are saying here, the MLOps have been starting to get into that and doing some research on that as well. Um, you know, because I work for a company that has observability solutions as well. So how do we use something like, you know, an observable solution to keep track of, of machine learning models? So all this stuff I think will be, um, we can definitely plug it in somewhere, at least at, at a high level, um, how it works and, and, and trying to show you the steps to, to put things into production. And eventually I think with your project, having it something online, right? Having a basic example online, maybe a demo, um, you can showcase this, right? You can showcase it in your resume. You can, I think that's the reason why I think it sh this is, shouldn't be a waste of time. You shouldn't feel like it's a waste of time, but you know, you need to put that, that commitment as well. Um, and, and I'm going to try my best to do so with your feedback. Oh, okay. So we have five more minutes. What's the feedback on the, on the submitted reports? I think in summary, I would say, um, I really love them. Honestly, like I went through each one of them. I actually have a some, some TAs helping me out. Thanks to the TAs, by the way. Um, thank you very much for that. It really helps, you know, because I, I do have a lot of projects that I work on as well. And it really helps me to, you know, it, it really buys me some time, but I, I went through, you know, all the reports uh, myself. Um, and I graded some myself as well. Um, I would say, I would say, I'm, you know, when I read through them, I, I just got highly, highly motivated because what I saw was like people really, really, you know, showing this interest to learn. And I think that's quite important, right? So keeping yourself motivated to learn is, is quite hard, especially with these days of what's going on. Um, but you need to hold your, yourself accountable. And this is one way to do so uh, by documenting what you're doing. So writing a report, maybe submitting some code somewhere or changing something somewhere. And just encourage yourself to do that. Um, so I'm quite motivated based on what I saw from the reports and the answers that I, that I received. Um, some of them would have benefited from more explanations, but I think people get the gist at, at least um, from the first chapter, uh, which is what I was looking for, just to get an idea of what it is. Um, because at least the historical stuff, you know, it's, it's, it's just history, but it's quite useful to know because it, you, you understand what motivates deep learning or what motivates machine learning and, and what drives that progress. So very, very, very happy about the reports um, in summary, yeah. Oh yeah, the Java. <laughs> so, okay, this became a Q&A, <laughs> but something else, and not, not about the book. It's, it, it's quite interesting to see the question. I do get a questions a lot. If you have ever asked me a question, maybe somewhere online and I haven't answered you, um, it's not that I don't want to answer you. It's just that we get too much question, too much questions, and I cannot answer all of them. But at some point, I may, I may um, answer your question. Um, just, just, just have patience, okay? Um, yeah, so, so this one was about Java's language reproduction, or is it okay to use Python? Oh yeah, there's a discussion as well as in terms of, you know, I think, I think I, maybe five years ago, I think was, I was, while I was still in school, we used to have this discussion about, you know, comparing Python with something like Ruby, which one is faster, or even C++, which one is faster. Obviously, C++ is a beast, but um, yeah, we always had this discussion, but I think it's, it's becoming a lot better, as I was saying earlier. Like, I think developers are focusing on creating tools which are not just easy to use, but also 
makes it makes your life easier in terms of you know how how a practitioner might, might end up using that tool. So you know, giving you the right functionalities, right? How to transform your data, how to deal with your data. Um, so I think it's getting better. I, I'm really optimistic about this. Like I've seen a lot of changes, like the profiler, for instance, something as basic as a profiler. Um, I, I had expected that Python would create something like this way, way early on, but I'm glad to see it now because this is actually one of those tools to diagnose your models, which is great. You need to do that and you need to be, you get used to that. Um, Cause this whole is an, uh, it's an iterative process and you need tools to help you with that. Um, in terms of production, I think there's conversation about what is better, what is best for production. I wouldn't worry too much about this, to be honest. I think the tools that we're developing these days, um, companies are adopting PyTorch really heavily, and you start to see big companies make a lot of investments um, in these different toolkits, TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. This will become a question of preference, I think, at the end of the day. Um, but you know, you have other tools which are definitely, definitely um, are quite more efficient, but <clears throat> um, the way we're using these tools these days and, and how we're putting deep learning models into production, um, I wouldn't worry too much about it as far as, as far as I've read and you know, updated myself. I think Python is good. People can agree. Wow, so much questions. How can I answer all these questions? Oh, it's, it's complicated. Okay. Yeah, it became more of a more of a open Q and A. Anyone wants to say anything? By the way, any anybody wants to say anything about the, the study program? Are they liking it? Um, how is it? <laughs> Someone says found the st statistician in the room. Wow, we have a statistician, that's great. <laughs> that's great to have. This makes it a lot of interest. And someone was posting that, <clears throat> uh, just gonna spend a minute on that. Someone posted something really interesting the other day. Um, I think it was on LinkedIn. I don't remember the name of the person, but someone was like, I prefer to actually study this stuff in a group rather than studying it alone. I think I've learned that over the years that uh, doing things in collaboration with other people um, yeah, I think it, it does help. I mean, it's so wonderful that we can connect with our people and, and, and work on projects. Um, this is just a side thing, but I think over the years, that's something I've recommended people to do, like be open to collaborate with other folks and uh, reach out to people. Um, I do get a lot of people reaching out to me to work on projects. I don't get, I don't have enough time to, to, to work on a lot of projects, but I do collaborate with people in our community in a Slack group um, on research projects and you know side things like that. Um, so reach out to people and, and, and work on the groups. I think it's quite amazing to share that because in the end, if you're aiming to get better at deep learning and, and you know, maybe are seeking a job or something like that or want to apply it in research, you're going to be working in a group. You cannot run away from that. Um, and that things, like, things like deep learning, where you have all these different components, you have the modeling, you have the, you know, the data processing, you have the data analysts, then you have the people uh, MLOps, you really have to know, you, know, you have to understand how to work in a group and, and this is your opportunity to do so I think um, you know so that's why I wanted to create the group project just to let you get that experience and if you have any questions about how you might go about doing that um, I'm here I'm here to answer those questions and I know a lot of people may have experience on that as well uh, in this group <clears throat> okay um, I think that'll be it um, there are questions you know we have a lot of questions but um, I'm excited for the upcoming chapters. I think in the upcoming chapters, we'll start to, you'll start to see modeling, which is what you came here for. Um, go through those fundamentals, get comfortable with you know, terminologies, right? Terminologies are quite important. Uh, what is automatic differentiation? What is an eigen decomposition? What is uh, you know, the norms? All this stuff, get comfortable with it because it will come back again. You read papers, papers reference these things all the time. Uh, I think it, it, this book is quite useful for that. Um, and, and the material shared here, I'm, I'm quite optimistic about it. Um, and you definitely will learn a lot here. So thank you everyone. Have a great weekend, I would say, um, wherever you are in the world. And thank you for joining us. Thanks. <laughs>